Today we're going to look at four early civilizations found in Africa. The first civilization is the African civilization of Aksum. The kingdom of Aksum rose to power from roughly the year 350 AD to 600 AD. It was located on the east coast of Africa, next to three major bodies of water, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea. It is also in close access or close proximity to the Nile River and also in close proximity to the Arabian Peninsula or the Middle East. Aksum was unique in that it was the first Christian empire in Africa. Christianity was most likely the influence of trade between the people of Aksum and Christian traders living on the Arabian Peninsula. Aksum has been spoken of in the Bible. Legend has it that the Queen of Sheba, who is believed to have lived where the kingdom of Aksum would develop, made a journey to the city of Jerusalem. There she met with a great Jewish king, King Solomon, and the two fell in love. When she returned to Aksum, she carried King Solomon's child. That child would grow up to be the first king of the kingdom of Aksum. As that young man became older, he would go back to Jerusalem to meet his father. While there, he was gifted with a Christian relic known as the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a gold-covered wooden chest that is said to hold the two stone tablets that are inscribed with the Ten Commandments. It is said that uh, uh, Sheba's and Solomon's son returned to Aksum with the Ark of the Covenant. And even though today the kingdom of Aksum no longer exists, some Christians still believe that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia, which is a nation in Africa where Aksum once existed, and that that Ark of the Covenant is being protected by the Ethiopian people. Now that's a story of faith. We do know, however, that Axiom was a powerful Christian kingdom for a time because we can see evidence of Christianity in some of the architecture that has been uncovered. Now the Axumites built a complex infrastructure and they traded with other Eurasian civilizations. Evidence of Axum's influence has been found by the fact that coins that the Axumites used have been located as far away as India. Furthermore, evidence of their advanced engineering or their sophisticated engineering has been found in ruins of great cities like the city of Adalon. This is an artist's rendering of the city of Adalon, but it demonstrates uh, how sophisticated Aksumite architects and engineers were. We have also found steles, which are like large monuments Maybe a better way to think of what a stele is, is if you know what a tombstone is. If you've been to a cemetery, you've seen a tombstone. A tombstone marks where somebody has been buried. Sometimes, often actually, on a tombstone, you'll find a person's name, the year they were born, the year they died, and maybe a little bit about their life inscribed on the tombstone. Steles, like tombstones, tell a story about the person who is buried beneath them. So they're like great tombstones for great people. Most likely, they mark the burial of very important people in Axum society. How did Axum prosper? Well, Axum controlled trade among Africa, India, and the Mediterranean. How did they accomplish this? One way is that they sailed on dows, which were these nimble wooden boats. This, uh, and using these boats, they were able to expand trade in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. And they traded for things like tortoise shells, ivory, gold, emeralds, spices, and incense. Our next kingdom that we will be looking at 
is the Kingdom of Zimbabwe. Now, Zimbabwe thrived in southern Africa from 700 to 1450 AD. Zimbabwe was a medieval stone city of incredible wealth and prestige. It was an economic power in southeastern Africa at the same time that in Europe, people were experiencing, experiencing some of the worst times in European history. Today, if we were to visit Zimbabwe, we would find its ancient ruins. Zimbabwe is the site of the largest known settlement ruins in sub-Saharan Africa. They are second in size to the ruins of ancient Egypt, which are the largest ruins found in Africa. The name Zimbabwe comes from the Shona word Mad Zimbabwe, which means big house of stone. You can see images of these Mad Zimbabwe's here. At its height, the Kingdom of Zimbabwe had over 18,000 people. Society consisted mostly of trading and farming, and whatever the society would produce, the king would receive half of the spoils. The way that the city was laid out also tells us that there was a social hierarchy. And this is just a fancy way of saying that there were many different levels for people in society. When we look at the Mad Zimbabwe, which we see here, the largest Mad Zimbabwe was reserved for the king or queen and perhaps their family. Outside of the largest Mad Zimbabwe, we found ruins of smaller Mad Zimbabwe's, which would have been perhaps uh, reserved for people of nobility within the society or important people but not quite as important as the king or the queen. And then on the very outer edge surrounding the um, king's mad Zimbabwe, we would find smaller ruins. And these were probably the remnants of small houses meant for the peasants, the farmers, perhaps even slaves in Zimbabwe society. Now, Zimbabwe's legacy goes beyond its incredible ruins, and it extends across the globe. It was rich with ivory and gold, and it would trade these resources for goods from across the Indian Ocean. Zimbabwe took advantage of its location between the gold mines in south of Africa and the many port cities along Africa's east coast. And being able to take advantage of this location they were able to profit from the gold and ivory trade. Now our next empire is the empire of Ghana, which thrived from about 800 to 1100 AD. Ghana was located between two rivers on the west coast of Africa, the Niger River and the Senegal River. Ghana was an important trade city. At its start, Islam was already being introduced to the region by Muslim merchants. Although the empire of Ghana would never become officially Islamic, it would be influenced by the religion through trade. Like the West African empires after them, they established their wealth through controlling and taxing the gold and salt trade. Ghana used its location between the two rivers, the Niger and the Senegal, to control the trade of gold and salt. As merchants or traders would travel through their region to the gold mines for which they would trade their salt for gold, the empire of Ghana would prosper from the gold itself, which they laid claim to, as well as placing a tax on the traders who passed through their territory. Think about Ghana was almost like a toll booth. If you wanted to trade your salt or your gold, you had to pay a tax to the empire of Ghana. Now, why would anyone pay one pound of gold for one pound of salt? What we need to understand is that gold was abundant in Ghana. And when there's more of something, the less value it has, and vice versa. 
because salt was more scarce than gold in this region, and because salt served many several, <laughs> excuse me, many important purposes, people were willing to pay a significant amount of gold for salt. Now, what was the importance of salt? Well, we know we use it to spice food today. But at this time in history, we have to remember that as far as it relates to keeping food fresh, there were no refrigerators. Salt was used as a preservative. It was often, um, they would often pack your meats in salt as a way to uh, dry and preserve the meats. What the salt would do was absorb much of the moisture from the meat, allowing it to be, uh, to last for a longer period of time before spoiling or rotting. This was extremely important, especially in an environment as hot as Western Africa. Now, Ghana's kings never accepted the religion of Islam, and in part because of their refusal to accept the religion, the empire would fall. However, their control of the gold and salt trade set the, the foundations for every other Western African empire after them including the Empire of Mali. Now, the Empire of Mali flourished from the years 1200 to 1500. While this empire thrived, again, in many places in medieval Europe, people were experiencing some of the worst periods in their history. The rulers of Mali took control of the gold and salt trade established by Ghana, and the Mali Empire became a center for wealth, education, and Afro-Islamic culture. Not only was the Empire of Mali active in the gold and salt trade, but it was also active in the trans-Saharan slave trade. Now we need to understand that slavery has existed since the beginning of human history. It was no different in Africa or in the Empire of Mali, where prisoners of war often became slaves and were sometimes traded just like any other commodity or thing of value. Mali was eventually ruled by Mansa Musa, who was possibly the richest man in history. By today's comparisons, he was probably wealthier than Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos put together. Now, Mansa Musa was a Muslim or a member of the Islamic faith. During his lifetime, he did what any true Muslim was supposed to do. He made a once-in-a-lifetime hajj, or pilgrimage, to the city of Mecca on the Arabian Peninsula. The city of Mecca is considered to be one of the holiest cities in the Islamic faith. During that journey, he gave away gold along his entire route. When he would return to Mali, he brought back scholars and artists, engineers and scientists, philosophers, and they would change not only the Empire of Mali, but also change how foreigners viewed Africa. Now, there's a really great Ted Ed movie, or quick documentary about Mansa Musa, and I'll post that if you would like to watch that. Now, news of Mansa Musa's wealth became so famous, he was eventually included on what was called the 1375 Catalan Atlas. When we zoom into the atlas, we can see a picture of Mansa Musa holding a large gold nugget. Mansa Musa literally put Africa on the map. It was further proof that African civilizations were sophisticated and advanced. Now, you could also imagine if you were a European at this time and you saw this map, you might feel compelled to go to Africa for yourself to see if you could find and perhaps exploit this gold that Mansa Musa was purported to have had, and which he certainly did. This could be part of what led to some of the problems for Africa and its exploitation in later centuries. As Mali prospered, Mali's city of Timbuktu became a center for trade and learning. 
A major Islamic university was built, and the city was established as a scholarly center for Africa. The reason we know so much about this is that it was visited by one of history's most successful travelers, a man named Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta was an Islamic scholar who, like Mansa Musa, set off on his own Hajj, or his own pilgrimage to Mecca, from the city of Tangiers in Morocco in the year 1325. He vowed never to take the same road twice, and he, uh, during his 16 years of travel, he would travel over 75,000 miles and to three different continents. After 16 years of traveling, again, not by train or plane or automobile, because none of that existed, but by foot or pack animal, camel, horse, or boat, he would eventually return to Morocco in Northern Africa, where he would record his travel story. Ibn Battuta's accounts of his travels are one of the best historical accounts we have from this era. This is a map of Ibn Battuta's travels throughout those 16 years. This gives you just an I. Uh, this gives you a good idea of just how far he traveled during this time and how impressive it is when you consider, again, no planes, no trains, and no automobiles. Because of Mansa Musa, Because of Mansa Musa, the Empire of Mali became a rich Afro-Islamic empire. Now, this is just to recap what we've learned so far. So there are four early African civilizations that we've examined. The first is Aksum, which was the Christian sailing kingdom to the northeast. The next was Zimbabwe, the stone kingdom to the south. Then Ghana, which was the gold and salt kingdom to the west. And finally, Mali, the Islamic kingdom of education and wealth ruled by Mansa Musa. Just a couple of tips to help you remember one empire from the other or distinguish one empire from the other. When we talk about Ghana, we remember gold and salt. So just say to yourself, Ghana, gold and salt, Ghana, gold and salt. To distinguish Mali from the other empires, we think of M&Ms. So you have Mali Mansa Musa, who was a Muslim, who traveled to Mecca and returned and built mosques. Now, how did African history survive? The histories, cultural practices, and stories of early African civilizations were preserved and passed down by African storytellers known as griots. In some African societies, they did not record their histories, but instead they memorized them. That was the job of the griot. Their job was to remember their histories of their people and to be able to recite and pass on those histories to future generations. So let's finish with the legacy of early African empires. These are the three big takeaways that we should understand after viewing the early African civilizations. Number one, we should know that African civilizations were sophisticated and advanced for their time. They had established trade, religion, and government. They were thriving in many ways better than some other places in other parts of the world. Africa was and is rich with a variety of landscapes, cultures, and histories. Africa is not just one thing. It is a diverse continent, whether it is its geography or its peoples 
and its histories. And finally, although slavery did exist in Africa, it would be the arrival of Europeans that would make slavery worse. So slavery has always existed, and in Africa is no different. But when Europeans would arrive, they would make slavery, the practice of slavery, worse. And here is just a glimpse of Africa today. Sometimes when we think about Africa, we get the image of this uh, village down here in the bottom right corner in our minds. And certainly we can find places like this in Africa today. This is in fact a village that would have been found in the Republic of the Congo. However, we can find advanced, sophisticated, maybe even futuristic cities in Africa today. In this upper left-hand quarter is the city of Cairo in Egypt. You can see it's been built on the banks of the Nile River. If you were to turn this camera the other way, you would be facing the desert. You would see the pyramids. You would see the Sphinx. But it is a modernized city. Down here is the city of Johannesburg, which is found in South Africa. Again, a very sophisticated, advanced, modern city. And then you have this seaside village over here. And this would have been, or this would be found on Africa's west coast, along what is called the Ivory Coast. So as you can see from these four pictures of Africa today, it is a diverse and in some ways advanced and sophisticated society.